it's becoming interesting and quiet. Uh, apparently, it means that it's time to begin. Very good. Uh, excellent. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you all for coming here. Uh, welcome, everybody, to in foreign ministry. A lot of you know this place very well, <laughs> been here very often. Um, and and uh, apparently, the, the one of the reasons why we are here of course, is that the human rights diplomacy is very high in the student agenda, has always been uh, in our uh, diplomacy, and the emphasis on, on, on women's rights is, is on very top of, of this human rights agenda that we, we have had here. Um, and of course, if we look what is happening in the world in, in those last few years, then there is very little that, um, that we can be um, happy of or satisfied. So things are moving not in the best direction. Uh, so it means even more important of protecting gender equality and empowerment of women in, in those difficult times. But I'm sure that the panel will give us at least some, some uh, small, bright future uh, in, in, in difficult times. Uh, so it's very interesting to, to see how, how this um, discussion will go. And, and it's even more important because I think uh, today marks the International Day of the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict. So uh, even more important, uh, especially during, uh, during the, the Russian war in Ukraine. So, um, and uh, just to conclude, this uh, very short opening is uh, to, um, uh, to make you aware that there will be uh, a nice uh, informal uh, discussion and glass of wine after the panel outside there. So please don't run away. Stay here. The, the, the discussions will follow. And of course, the great photo exhibition uh, by Marianne Miko is, is out there, and, and um, it's possible to uh, to see in the lobby. And, and uh, I'm also very curious that the pictures are so good quality. I mean, it must have been some uh, either very professional take or, and, and good equipment together. <laughs> so Just we'll... a quick remark: iPhone. iPhone. So <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> yes, here we are. That this is the <laughs> this is the time. So it means that uh, that the person behind the iPhone has, must have been very good. Anyway, so uh, welcome all once more. Uh, enjoy the discussion and uh, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Neve Raud. I'm a journalist, freelance journalist lately, but I've been covering the United Nations in my previous work for over 20 years. So I'm quite familiar with those, with those issues. And it's, it's great to see such a great uh, number of people who are interested in women's rights, because we were discussing that before here, before the start, that. Uh, Debate or discussion, I, I would not call it debate, it's more discussion on, on those issues have not been held in Estonia for a long time. So Mina, thank you for organizing it. I think the, the issues are important and, and where we are now on those issues. Because when Mina called me to host this, I said, okay, on women's rights, we're doing just great. And she said, no, no, look deeply into that. And then I looked at the United Nations, United States, the country where I lived for a long time. And of course, the, the processes and developments are not all good. But we will touch upon that. It's great to welcome in our panel two ambassadors from Sweden, Ingrid Tersman, and you. from Ukraine, Mariana Betsa. Ms. Mariana Miko, member of the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of Women. Welcome. And Mr. Christian Beske, Gender Equality and Equal Treatment Commissioner of Estonia. Welcome. We will have a discussion here on the stage about 45, 50 minutes, and then open up uh, the stage for questions, so please, please have your opinion ready and, and uh, participate in our discussion. As Mert said, today is International Day of the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, and tomorrow actually is World Refugee Day. So this, this is really important time in international calendar to discuss those issues. The World Refugee Day was works first marked in uh, 2001. The International Day of Elimination of Sexual Violence, 2015. And uh, it seems on both of those issues, the world has not done much. 
to, to be proud of. And of course, first, when we talked about both sexual violence and, and refugees, we think of Ukraine, mm -hmm. where we see not very far from us what, what is going on and, and these atrocities are continuing. <coughs> And they are both the center of those those atrocities is women. So first, I will give it to to you. How are those issues? What we discuss: women's rights and also gender-based violence and also refugees being refugees. How those are reflected in Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Do you have to press something? I think it's, it's on. Mm -hmm. it's on. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, dear ladies and gentlemen, and your excellencies. I'm very grateful for the Minister of Foreign Affairs for giving me this opportunity to be also one of the panelists here and on this important topic of um, women, peace and security, implementation also, Resolution 1325. Indeed, um, women, peace and security has been always very high on Ukraine's agenda, uh, especially from 2014, when the Russian aggression just uh, started. Um, we were among the first countries to also, we were among the co-sponsors of Resolution 1325. And uh, we were actually, and I, th I think we are still are the first country in conflict who liberated national action plan. Yes. And we have two, uh, well, we have already uh, liberated two national action plans uh, so far, but of course they have to be adjusted very much and according to the security challenges and especially pressing challenges, which started from 24th of February last year when a full-scale Russian invasion happened. And for 15 months, we see so many atrocities, so many um, acts of uh, war crimes, genocide, terrorism, but also sexual violence against women, against children, against men as well. Of course, we do not have some uh, comprehensive statistics on how many um, gender-based violence crimes have been um, investigated uh, because there are lots of uh, uh, crimes committed on the occupied ter territories of Ukraine, temporary occupied territories. But so far, uh, 171 crime has been um, uh, investigated by the General Prosecution Office, though it's totally not representative because uh, many people, or many men as well, they're afraid to speak about such crimes. Mm -hmm. They feel uh, ashamed, and uh, or they're just... Uh, want to continue with their lives, and many are not reported because uh, the war um, uh, continues every day, and every day we, we are witnessing uh, crimes. So yes, indeed, for Ukraine, uh, among all uh, terrible crimes that Russia perpetrates on a daily basis, uh, crimes against women, uh, gender-based uh, crimes, uh, take place, unfortunately, every day. And we already uh, have modified our national action plan, which was for the 2020 till 2025. Um, we try to um, broaden the groups of women who um, were either forcefully deported um, to um, Russia or were kept in captivity, <coughs> or uh, they were um, uh, gender-based violence was committed against them. So we try to uh, broaden the target group to which humanitarian assistance, financial assistance, psychological assistance has been provided uh, because this is extremely important and uh, I mean entire Ukraine is under trauma very very severe trauma mental trauma as well because uh, the repercussions of this war will take years maybe decades even do you feel international support on those issues? Yes, we do feel an international support, and uh, we would like to have more support as well. In terms of um, uh, the human resources and financial resources are very limited during the time of war for Ukraine. And uh, we would like to have also the center of rehabilitation for, for women who suffered sexual uh, crimes. Um, we would like to have more psychological centers. Uh, and of course, uh, to train our psychologists, our specialists, our experts who work with uh, this vulnerable groups uh, on a daily basis. We'll hear just shortly how the Committee on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of Women is dealing with the Ukrainian issues. But uh, first, let's go to Sweden. Sweden has been really on forefront on mm -hmm. women's rights. So how mm -hmm. is the situation in Ukraine reflecting, reflected in Sweden? Uh, 
With a tremendous support uh, to support uh, Ukraine, uh, not only with the military packages, the humanitarian assistance, everything that we have done as um, EU presidency over the, uh, during the, the spring. We have two more weeks to go, and we hope that we will be able to, uh, uh, to adopt the 11th uh, package um, uh, on support to Ukraine by then. But also, we have, since the war shift has started, we have incre increased our bilateral support to Ukraine. And uh, this year, the government is shifting our support actions uh, development aid to Ukraine. So it will be the largest recipient of all our aid. Previously, that was Afghanistan, and we know why we are not in Afghanistan anymore, apropos the women's rights. Uh, but Ukraine will be the largest recipient. And a lot of the work that we do are exactly in the areas that you, uh, that you mentioned, gender issues and to support victims, mm -hmm. and also all over the country, and also through the decentralisa decentralization work that we have done with you uh, over the years as a good platform for getting the aid mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. But I'd just like to commend Ukraine that had both the, the courage and the ability to update the plan from 2016 in the midst of war. And I think in that plan, you have done something quite extraordinary. You have moved women from victims of uh, crimes to actors. Yeah. And I believe that that can actually be used as an example for others when we look at national action plans for gender. Yeah. Thank you so much. One quick question. Uh, three years ago, 2019, four years ago already, uh, there was a debate on, on this issue today, four years ago, on the day of this sexual violence, um, victims of sexual violence day. And, and there was at the United Nations Security Council, when Estonia was a member of, mm -hmm. of the Security Council, and the opinion that most of the states said that there should be a paradigm shift on how resources for war victims and victims of sexual violence are allocated in the post-COVID-19 world. Do you think it's still present, this need kind of to change the mindset? I think during lots happened to gender equality and women's rights during COVID, and I think that we saw that globally. When governments or regimes or authoritarian regimes had the opportunity to kind of to um, uh, take the resources to away. Take the resources away and to adopt action that would limit certain groups' uh, space in the society, then women were among the first victims of that. I was then working in Central Asia uh, with uh, several of the countries there, and every little step that was taken, the first victims or those who were suffering the most, that was actually women. And once you take these hard-won rights uh, away, uh, that countries like in Central Asia have been working with the United Nations and bilateral donors for Yes, it's very, very hard to put that back. That also increased the level of violence in the societies and violence against women in the homes and also, of course, against uh, children. But so now when you're talking about European mm -hmm. action in, during the Ukrainian war, do you see that this shift still is, is there, that the uh, women and the victims of war don't get enough resources? Because countries, countries have their economic problems and, and the war aid, mm -hmm. military aid, defense spending so much. Yeah, but I think the, the needs are probably much larger than we can see. So I would say that we would need to put more resources into this and not less. Marianne, on international level, how in your committee is the war in Ukraine and, and those atrocities against women reflected? Thank you, Nana, of that question. Um, honestly, there are like a uh, bit different approach than uh, those institutions which are uh, by nature executive ones. In our committee, we are following, we are like watchdogs of uh, CEDAW, which is in one hand committee, and from the other hand that is convention. And in, in convention, in article one, we immediately identify, I mean, violence against women, which means that we all know that articles hierarchy is very important. And if that is in the article number one, it means that that is extreme priority. But above than that, uh, we have working group, uh, which is working group of Ukraine, uh, which means that uh, we, 23 international independent experts, uh, members of uh, CEDAW, uh, voluntarily are um, organizing our work. And there are two working groups of uh, that kind. One is Afghanistan. Mm -hmm and the other Ukraine. So you understand, no other, but I mean Ukraine. Now, uh, our work is basically that 
countries are coming uh, to Geneva to introduce their country reports periodically. And recently, there was Slovakia. And now, uh, few of us who asked questions, because that is kind of hearing entire one day, we call that constructive dialogue. And there were questions, as for Slovakia uh, has received quite a few, almost one million, I mean, war refugees. And the basic question about that was how there is and how is organized and is that smooth process to get to medical assistance if rape is concerned, abortion is needed. Because Poland is number one with restriction of that kind, but Slovakia is not any better. So uh, we asked, that was not uncomfortable uh, to, to ask from our side, but a bit uncomfortable to answer from the Slovakian side. So we are more hands-on, straight, I mean, what is that about? And that is very detailed information. So recently we dealt very sufficiently about, I mean, war refugees from Ukraine. I mean, basically they are women. And Estonia, how is Estonia supporting and dealing with those issues? A lot of refugees are here in Estonia, a lot of women are here and also the victims of, of sexual violence. How is Estonia dealing and supporting those, those issues? That's yeah, Chris, for me, you. okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, thank, thank you very much. Um, so indeed, maybe I would uh, first come back to uh, what Marianne was uh, just saying, that uh, I think it, in um, sort of last year when, uh, when the war started, um, what uh, we realized in, in, in Europe was that uh, there are many people, many women coming to, uh, to Europe and, uh, and not um, all the countries have these uh, services uh, available for uh, for women so there is uh, not a proper access to the reproductive uh, health uh, services um, and 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 that is, that is a problem so so indeed when you end up in such countries so what what do you do do you go to another country which uh, for example in the case of Poland may be a neighboring country Lithuania where if you go there uh, there may be some restrictions in place that only the people who have um, the national health security can access to their services May, maybe that's a, a, a question so so there was a lot of uh, confusion around it and i'm very happy actually to see that my ex-employer um, uh, european institute for gender equality has uh, has done the, the mapping of the uh, of, of the um, uh, member states and uh, their uh, reproductive uh, health and uh, health services available for uh, people fleeing the um, uh, the war. Um, when it comes to uh, Estonia, I'm afraid I'm not really the uh, the right people person to uh, to ask uh, about these uh, specialized uh, services because uh, the as the Equality Commissioner, we do we do not uh, have the mandate really to uh, to deal with uh, with such issues, but I uh, sincerely hope that uh, our um, sort of uh, network of organizations that uh, provide uh, assistance are there ready to, to so support people in need, women in need. Hopefully there is somebody in the audience who can maybe later uh, mm -hmm. talk about how Estonia is tackling those issues. But let's move on and let's go far up. Let's take this kind of mile high view now. Mm -hmm. We're talking about women's rights. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the topic of our panel. And, but let's, let's map, in your view, where is the world standing on that now? What, what is this backlash? We're talking about going back on some issues. When, when you are not following this day by day, so let's, let's, from your point of view, paint the picture. Where, where is the world now? And maybe we start, Marianne, from you. Thank you. The good news is that last year, 2022, Globally, all functioning parliaments have at least one woman. That is historical, <laughs> first time in history. So that is good news. Bad news is, like um, my own, own country, Estonia, evolution makes 
little step ahead. That's not Tiger Leap. I mean, Estonia is a little bit better than, I mean, world average. 26 is the average. So the thing is, it needs to be either or gender, but not less than one third. And from perspective of United Nations and CEDAW, uh, respectively, parity is the word. Not any more quota, 30, 40, parity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Half of men, half of women, let's work on that. So maybe I'm more enthusiastic and optimistic, but, but look, I mean, if big picture, then I see all parliaments with women, and now let's talk about parity. So the world is moving on? <laughs> Slightly, <laughs> bit by bit, but I mean, of course, I mean, countries, for instance, Estonia, I mean, um, except social democrats, there is no kind of internal, in parties kind of list which needs to be either zebra or, or zip list, how do you call that? How you bring in, I mean, decision-making uh, women if there is not that kind of uh, mechanism. Otherwise, that is like evolution. Every single period, after four years, we get two, three more women in Rikikoko. If we are marching like that, say 60 more years. But still, let me be a skeptic and ask about these steps back on, on that field. <laughs> Ambassador Dersman, mm -hmm. so what are we are talking? In Sweden, of course, we heard about the feminist foreign policy. Mm -hmm. That is not anymore the central issue in Sweden. That we can discuss, discuss uh, describe as a kind of step back. But the overall, where we are now? I start, I start with the, the bird's view, and I would say that over the last decade there has been uh, step backs or setbacks, which we haven't seen in many, many years. I think those of us who started working on gender issues in the 90s, we were part of a very different world. Look at the Beijing platform, 1995, and all the resolutions that had been coming after that. But over the last 10 years or so, there has been tremendous setbacks. There are authoritarian regimes, there are movements, um, and there are rights being taken away from women in various countries. I think Afghanistan is probably one of the extremist, most extreme examples that we can find. But also, I think, in our neighborhood and to the west of the Atlantic, we can look at abortion, we can look at the access to contraceptives, we can look at the funding for women's organizations, the dialogue between governments and women's organizations, and that is seeping through. And I think those who are working on these issues much more carefully and closely than I am are, are quite uh, quite worried. Yes, that's a good thing, one, <laughs> one, one, one woman in each parliament, least, but I think we least. should set our standards a little bit higher, or our aspirations should be higher. But so I, th I think there's, reason, there's uh, really reason for concern, because when these rights are being eaten up a bit, then it's hard to take them back. So I think we who then come from countries where you have a close link between democracy and gender equality, because that is linked like this. Democracies mm -hmm. have good gender equality. Gender equality prone countries, they are democracies. I think we have to continue to stand up and fight for this and do it together with our allies. Isn't Sweden those issues kind of written in stone that you can't turn back the clock? It's not possible. I cannot see that it would be possible. We can go back to the feminist policy a little bit yeah, um, later. later. Uh, but they are so ingrained in our society and in our politicians and in the parties. There's no party that could actually move that forward and then believe that they would be successful. Uh, I don't think that would work. You from Ukraine. Well, I would say Ukraine progressed a lot, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, when I joined the diplomatic service 20 years ago, uh, there wasn't one woman ambassador, so at least one woman ambassador, at least one woman, woman in the parliament. There was only one woman ambassador, and it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And for some time, I would say before the Revolution of Dignity, before 2014, when we signed also the association agreement with the EU, we tried to implement uh, the norms and requirements, um, it was quite a battle for, for example, for a woman at the diplomatic uh, front and for me personally to, to, be prom to get promotion or just even to go for abroad on, on certain posts because it was said, well, you're a woman, we need a man who would be more efficient, who would be more quick. Uh, well, there were different prejudices. It was uh, quite an era, I would say, even in our diplomatic experience of uh, diplomats in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. But it changed dramatically from 2014. 
after we signed the association agreement, we uh, put gender equality high on our, on our agenda. Yes, it was not easy, it's still going not that easy, but much better. Also, some figures, uh, when I was uh, appointed ambassador of Ukraine to Estonia in 2018, September 2018, uh, there were um, already five women ambassadors. From one to five, it's also number. Now, five years after, we have 14. It's also big progress, I would say, for, for, for us, but still a lot, a lot to go. And the main issue is that we uh, try to safeguard that there are quite a lot of women uh, in the diplomatic service now, and it, this is a huge priority and for our president and for the government and personal for our minister, who is very much for um, uh, women in diplomatic service. And we even started a campaign a few years ago. It was called He for She. Uh, in, in, I mean, it's, it's a well-known comment, but in, in, in the ministry itself. So now we have uh, men who are promoting women's rights, so it was not the case before. Uh, but I would say that um, now the main problem is the uh, pay, difference payments between men and women in, in Ukraine. This is a huge problem, though we joined uh, the EPIC uh, organization and we tried to raise salaries, but still there is a huge gap between men and women when they get salary, not at the um, uh, civil service, but uh, in the private sector, for example. And secondly, of course, women in leadership positions. This is still a, a lot uh, way to go. There are much more, more women in diplomatic, uh, uh, for example, or civil service in Ukraine. Um, Neil, I would say 50-50, but very few at leadership positions. So many at technical positions as well, many as junior diplomats. So the huge progress was started maybe from 2014, when we also uh, joined different, uh, like BRIS partnership, EPIC, uh, 1325 resolution, and many issues that we tried to implement gender equality in our society. But it's still a, a lot to go. So, as I heard, the desire to be in Europe, in the European Union, was kind of a push. It was a push, yes, because it was a totally different gender society, I would say, um, in, before 2014. It was, civil service was mainly male-dominated, diplomatic service was male-dominated. Well, I'm personally, not for quotas, personally, but I would say that it, 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 we have to start from somewhere. <laughs> so then, at the initial stage, the, they're important, because otherwise uh, it, it's very difficult for women to, to get promoted as well. Uh, but it should not be, on the other hand, made very artificial also. You know, there are issues when some men feel positive discrimination. They say, oh, now they want women. <laughs> you know, they, they don't want men. And so I, I also think that the male factor, the man fa factor should be competence, professionalism, and should be key at any job in general. Uh, not the gender so much, but to give a push for gender equality in general, especially in, in such countries as Ukraine, where it was not the case before for uh, the we signed uh, association given with the EU, then I think it, it's, it's fair to say that we need quotas and, and need some extra push for women to enter the service. Positive discrimination. I, I felt the same thing when Mina asked me to lead this, is, this is discussion about women's rights that I'm a man. Maybe a woman should do that, but why not man? So Christian, Estonia, first issue that comes to mind for many Estonians when we talk about gender balance or imbalance is, of course, the pay issue. Mm -hmm. I would actually go a step uh, now back uh, and coming back to the uh, global issues because I was uh, just thinking when uh, listening to other reflections that uh, we, uh, of course, when we talk about uh, these inequalities that uh, there are globally, we need to sort of uh, uh, look at what are we looking at. Are we looking at the outcomes? Are we looking at the representation or are we looking at uh, sort of the substance? And, uh, and uh, yes, I think representation matters uh, on, on, on every level, but we, uh, we we also need to check what, what is the situation in, in terms of outcomes. And I was checking before coming here the UN statistics as well. And uh, what I uh, read there, I was uh, also uh, a little bit shocked mm -hmm. because in my uh, own sort of understanding uh, knowledge, uh, I have more knowledge maybe what's happening in the European Union, but uh, I would like to just quote some figures. So um, they are saying that extreme poverty is on the rise and progress towards uh, its elimination has reversed. An estimated 435 million women and girls globally are living in extreme poverty. Uh, zero hunger uh, has increased, uh, so the gender gap in food security has risen dramatically during the pandemic with more women and girls going hungry. 
women's food insecurity levels were 10% higher than men's in 2020. So, uh, so these are the sort of facts that we uh, have. This is still the situation. So, um, so we can't uh, sort of overlook at this. Um, what are the sort of global outcomes of uh, gender inequalities? Um, and uh, um, and indeed, um, so uh, you mentioned also so, sort of legal uh, developments that are happening in in the states and uh, and elsewhere, also in in Europe, where some of the rights have been uh, taken away or they. Um, the, the situation has uh, become so complex, so you don't uh, anymore quite well understand who are the actors that uh, you are facing with. Is it just the political parties, or who is behind, or who is the driving force uh, behind this, um, let's say, backlash uh, towards gender equality? So these things, uh, I feel that they are very well uh, or very much connected to each other. So when we have these policies that are taking away certain rights, then we will see even worse situation in uh, in, in coming years and uh, for especially women and girls. When we uh, talk about Estonia, then um, uh, I think. It, um, well, coming back to first uh, to Europe, so when we look at the sort of gender equality uh, situation in Europe, then we, what we can say in the past 10 years it has stalled. If you look at the um, sort of different indicators uh, that are measuring uh, gender inequality, Estonia has made uh, progress in several areas, uh, for sure. But um, it uh, also has, um, let's not forget, there's uh, the highest segregation in the labor market uh, in Europe, uh, or one of the highest, and also in the education. So, so these are the sort of things that underpin the, the sort of cultural stereotypes that we have in the society, what is appropriate for a woman, what is appropriate for a man. And uh, in relation to that, so you mentioned the high pay gap that we have. Indeed, that's been a problem many years, and it's a little bit, of course, uh, uh, sort of sour uh, happiness that we're not anymore in the last place uh, as we have been for decades, but now we are the second, second last, last uh, <laughs> when it comes to the uh, gender. Well, who's the last? Um, Our sorry? Latvia. Latvia, Latvia, Latvia. yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so um, I think that's remains a problem and we need to talk about it, of course. So Marianne has a finger up. Yep. So. Uh, th that is a little remark about world as such. Um, one thing is we are comfortably in our continent, Europe. We are more comfortably in European Union. But if that big picture, and why I'm sort of hammering or underlining big picture, then those who have signed, okay, not signed, ratified that CEDO, which is kind of covered on note uh, worldwide, globally, there are 189. That is the, the best uh, kind of ratified ever, I mean, human rights treaty. So. Explain, what is CEDAW? This is the problem in international discussions that we're using those acronyms and people don't know. So what is it? That is C for convention and committee, E for elimination, D uh, um, of discrimination of uh, uh, all kinds of forms of women, okay. CEDAW. First was um, convention. 40 years ago, and now that is like watchdog. We are watchdog of that uh, CEDAW convention. And periodically, all those 189, we say not countries, but state parties, for instance, Palestine is part of that, uh, are coming to Geneva, that's every uh, after four years or five, and then they report what kind of uh, uh, achievements or black like, backlash is taking place as far as uh, women's rights are concerned. And now recently, what, what I wanted to go to Sweden and, and I identify myself not so much from Eastern European bloc, which I am there regionally, but like Nordic Baltic. That's more sort of like my, my understanding is there. Anyway, we had Iceland and we had recently Norway. But we had Mauritania, for instance, in the same time. Now, I'm coming to terminology, and that is very important, how we define problems. And for instance, in 
Nordic Hemisphere, or let's say specifically in Scandinavia, that is gender neutral policy already, which is like good thing. Don't mention that globally, because that is something which is very alarming. So, mm. but me, I try to tell that, look, that is achievement, that is advanced already, because number one in the world is who? Iceland, of course. Norway, number two. So uh, they have privilege to define or uh, bring new elements, but the world is lacking that understanding because that is very big uh, gap or, or distance they are ahead. Nevertheless, we have exactly the same kind of constructive dialogue. We propose in Geneva, 23 uh, members of CEDO, all kind of improvements which are needed for. Iceland had exactly the same 60 whatever compared with Venezuela, exactly the same amount. So that is a little bit kind of document. But I mean, if you follow those, what is substance of, uh, of those paras, that's a little bit like day and night, day and night. Plus, of course, we like um, experts coming from Africa, Asia, Latin America, we all bring with rucksack backpack our own kind of traditions and habits and our political culture. So sometimes that is extremely complicated how to speak in one voice through convention. That is very short convention, only 17 uh, uh, articles, but how to make that? This is very difficult. The same in the United Nations in New York to speak in one voice. But Sweden gave us a new term almost in international affairs, feminist foreign policy. And now it's, where is it now? It looks mm. like it's kind of a little bit faded. It's not anymore an agenda that, that high up as it was. Mm. That was our um, pre, pre, pre foreign minister, Margot Wallström, who 2014 announced the feminist foreign policy. And I think for many of us who'd been in the ministry and worked on gender issues and others for many years, we were a little bit surprised because this is something that we already do. Because it's so ingrained in our foreign policy, it's in our country, it's in our Nordic uh, cooperation, Nordic Baltic, EU, etc., and also in our development aid. Let's but define the, the terms. The term, what is it? What is it? It's a, it's a term to um, put words on the need to give resources, representation, and rights to women. And I think what I liked about that once that I saw what she really wanted to do was that it really elevated the debate, which was then already under, under attack, as we said. And I think it um, annoyed so many, as I'm sure that many of you remember. But I think that also put, uh, put the onus on how important it was to discuss uh, the rights and the representation and the resources. Uh, so, but the, the support we provide to gender, I'm sure you know, I mean, that has always been with us, will always be, and it's, super, it's a super core of our foreign policy. Uh, then we had a shift of government in, the, uh, in September last year, a conservative, mid, mid, um, kind of conservative government, and they decided to remove the, the term. Uh, and they thought that this was kind of a bit of labeling, and we want to look at the substance and not at the labels. But what we have done before, uh, the substance that will continue continue. Uh, but what I'm interested in, in to see is, of course, that the countries who then followed our lead then on the feminist foreign policy, there are a few. It's uh, Germany, Canada, France, Luxembourg, Mexico, the Netherlands, and Spain, uh, how they view it today when a few years has passed. What it did do to us in the Foreign Service was that it gave us an impetus and a joy to work on gender issues in a sense that we perhaps had not had before. So let's hmm? look from Ukrainian side. What would be, let's fantasize, feminist well, I could, could I just say, Could I just say something? When I joined the ministry 30 years ago, I think we had two female ambassadors yeah. and two department heads, and now we are 50-50. Yeah. But Ukraine is moving so yeah, fast. Yeah, moving so fast, yes. This <laughs> will we'll do it <laughs> soon. So, but let's, let's say the world is kind of moving towards this concept of feminist foreign policy. Mm -hmm. How should that be viewed in Ukraine, from Ukrainian point of view? Uh, about uh, some of this, uh, this situation in Ukraine. How, how is Ukraine moving when, let's say, mm -hmm. in the ideal world, mm -hmm. Ukraine would have a feminine foreign policy? 
Well, uh, of course, uh, I think uh, right now gender equality is very high on our agenda. I mean, since we priority of us is to, to become an EU member state of all NATO member Even state. Even during the war. Yes, 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 absolutely. I would say that um, nearly 40 percent of uh, Ukrainian uh, defenders are women. And we have, uh, well, not all of them are members of the armed forces, but territorial defense as well. But a lot of women join, for example. Uh, uh, but I would say yes, uh, I would definitely see that uh, women are given first uh, leadership positions. This is still where we're lagging behind in many ways. Um, yes, equal um, payment for women and men. Uh, this is also where we are lagging behind. I think these are two areas where we definitely need progress more. But it is still quite a huge progress in comparison with even developments of five years. Um, we actually, for example, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, we uh, ordered gender audit for the first time in the history of all civil uh, civil services institutions in Ukraine. And we were surprised to see uh, how, how few women in leadership position we have. So the minister said that we definitely need, need women uh, as deputy ministers, ambassadors, and of course, at, as heads of the departments. Um, I, I will, I'm more than sure that we will continue this path, not only, of course, in the diplomatic service, but in the civil service in general. Uh, private sector is also, uh, we try to empower uh, women, and there are lots of women entrepreneurs, and many women who are internally displaced persons from the war, they moved to different regions, and they find themselves much better position right now, and because there are so many opportunities also to to, to, to be represented, but also to, to help Ukrainians during the times of war. So I'm more than confident that Ukraine will continue a very great um, implementation of uh, Resolution 1325 and our national action plan. Um, I'm, I'm very much confident that right now, um, Ukraine, in a very short period of time, hopefully will become EU member state. <laughs> and definitely we need to, to, to um, correspond to those standards set up um, by the EU and EU norms and values. Estonia. Yes, well, maybe uh, one reflection first uh, to Ukraine. It's, um, it's been for me also very, um, very nice uh, sort of meeting the different Ukrainian delegations which I have in, in, in past uh, month and uh, they um, all seem to be sort of very positive that right now there is a time to do make this change yeah. also in Ukrainian mm -hmm. uh, society. And what I also hear is that they, they, they want external support. They want also um, the, uh, well, uh, people, for example, from Estonia or other countries uh, to, to support uh, them in, in this process. So I think this is uh, really indeed an, an opportunity to make, make that change. But when it comes to um, uh, uh, sort of feminist foreign policy in Estonia, then I'm also not sure I'm the uh, right person uh, to ask. Maybe <laughs> Minna Lina would be <laughs> better to hear, or or anyone from the foreign ministry. But uh, but of course, I mean, uh, I, I totally agree with the Swedish ambassador as well that uh, uh, it's a, in a way it's a question of labeling. As as long as you are strong on the human rights issues, uh, if you make sure that uh, the development aid or the humanitarian aid uh, uh, that you give out, that uh, it has uh, a strong gender perspective, that mm -hmm. you, you know where it goes uh, and, um, and, and there are accountability mechanisms uh, in place properly, then um, of course, uh, I mean, does that make it uh, feminist for, for a feminist policy? Definitely is a part of it uh, as well. So. But if I may, little remark to bring, like globally, we had a constructive dialogue with Germany. And as Ingrid, you correctly said, that there are those who are followers of your uh, uh, feminist foreign policy. And I asked from uh, uh, German uh, government, look, you have wonderful terminology and seems that foreign, uh, feminist foreign policy is a uh, good strategy. But how that uh, feminist foreign policy is transferred or transmitted into your internal policy? And there are kind of uh, problems and concerns. So from a global perspective, I mean, nice you have a feminist foreign policy, but what is going on in your specific country? I'm not sort of like afraid that something is wrong in, in Sweden. Uh, 
but still, I mean, if you are coming to CEDO, definitely you get your 50 kind of recommendations. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, like, like East Iceland, Herd, and Norway. But nevertheless, I mean, that is one corner. But as 1325 is about women, peace, and security, but internally, mm -hmm. No pay cap. Yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, 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 follow. I mean, social care uh, uh, area are women well paid, and so on and so on. So the devil is in details. I mean, uh, foreign um, uh, feminist foreign policy leads sooner or later back to your capital mm -hmm. and to the different ministries. Mm -hmm. So, so that is not ding an sich, but that is much wider. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Ms. Christian. Yes, maybe to uh, build a little bit on that, I hope that is the case, uh, what Marianne just uh, described. But, uh, but in essence, uh, what was said is that indeed it's uh, in a way easier maybe to, uh, in a simplified manner, uh, to tell others what to do <laughs> rather than uh, to leave, uh, uphold the same exactly. uh, principles exactly. internally. And uh, we can see that also in, in a way um, uh, in, in many countries and also in Estonia. Uh, that where the uh, uh, gender mainstreaming or equality mainstreaming, depending on how you want to uh, name it, that all the policies that are in place or are being developed in, in the country should have the uh, uh, impact analysis, how these um, affect women and men in the society. Mm. But in reality, that does not really happen. I mean, it happens uh, very sporadically. So this is a huge, huge problem. Uh, it's uh, in the law that it should be done, but it, it's, it's not. So, so in a way, indeed, what you preach outside, you should be also doing this uh, internally in your own country. I'm absolutely on, uh, agreeing with Marianne on that, and, and I hope that it, it will have effect uh, also uh, uh, in the country as well. And now, before we open it up, I would like to touch upon a very explosive issue. And Christian, uh, we decided that you maybe can explain to us gender. This word has become so political that there are a lot of people who don't want to talk about women's rights because they are immediately asked, who is woman in today's world? Mm -hmm. So where we are with this gender discussion? Because, of course, there is behind that is the issue of trans transgender yeah. uh, people, their rights. So who is woman? We're talking about women's rights. Who is woman in today's world? That's also kind of very foggy and very explosive territory. Mm -hmm. So I would go maybe uh, a little bit back and um, just to, uh, to say that uh, over the um, sort of past three decades, uh, we've been using more and more the uh, terms of uh, uh, gender equality, gender inequalities, also in the sort of international uh, texts as well. But of course, gender can mean so many different th things. It depends like the context you use it, whether it's uh, in academia, whether it's in the activism, whether it's in the political texts. Uh, so it all really depends on, on the context where, where you use that. And if we uh, look at the sort of feminist thinkers already from long, long time ago, they, uh, they started to um, uh, sort of conceptualize as well that uh, it's not really the, the biology that only makes uh, you have the, uh, or makes you a woman, but it's also the social norms that are attached to the biology. So, so, so there is a long sort of uh, process behind it, and uh, and you're quite right. It's um, it's a hot topic, and uh, it's been brewing for a while. It started really in the uh, 90s with um, with a two major um, uh, conferences, UN conferences, one in Beijing, so uh, and the other one, the Population uh, Conference in Cairo. Uh, um, so, which uh, started to talk about uh, gender, they started also to talk about reproductive uh, rights issues, and um, uh, then there were um, more conservative actors who didn't uh, like where they, these policy developments are, are going, and ever since we have seen over these decades uh, a little bit like uh, it comes with the waves, uh, these uh, mobilizations ag against uh, gender equality. And for those who are really against it, uh, it doesn't matter what gender means. Gender becomes a sort of empty signifier. So everything uh, uh, that uh, uh, they don't like 
they, it can be said, oh, it's a part of gender ideology. Whether you talk about children's rights, whether you talk about uh, abortion, whether you talk um, any uh, anything really, Istanbul Convention is a is a good example where we have a convention that is basically there to um, uh, eliminate violence against women. Right, so this is the, the premise. But in many member states, it has been in instrumentalized, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's been said that it's, it goes um, sort of, it, it is part of the gender ideology, and we don't want uh, men to become women, and, and all of this. So th there is a whole uh, mess around it in a, in a way. And how do we come uh, out of it? Uh, I don't know, but uh, I think uh, it's important that we stay uh, true to what has been agreed. And we have been talking about in the policy documents in the EU, uh, also internationally, we have been talking about gender uh, equality. Uh, we have been talking about gender. And we know that the social structures around us, they influence how we are as women and men. And this is important part, because it's not only about biology that we can speak of. So, but is there a definition of what is gender in the world? Or is it like a terrorist in the United Nations where we can't still agree on, on the term? Yeah, well, gender, um, I, if I think about the um, um, definition, there, um, uh, there is also in the Istanbul Convention that uh, defines what gender is. It's the socially constructed uh, norms and um, I can't remember how the def definition exactly is, but it, but it puts uh, the emphasis also in in a, in a way to uh, the the society that uh, surrounds us. So so meaning these uh, norms, stereotypes, and whatever makes a man a man or a woman a woman. It's that it goes beyond bi biology. But sometimes it feels like a caricature. Like last week, one of the leading universities, United States, in the United States defined the word lesbian as a no man who has sexual relationship with no man. And the question was, why, where is woman there? Mm. Why ha you, we have to say no man, no man? The yeah. man is always mm -hmm. the center. So even the liberal side sometimes gets confused. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure there are confusions. And I don't know exactly the incident that you uh, refer to. And, and you can have like very strange sort of uh, constructions around it. But, uh, but, but it's important to, I think, to, to bear in mind that these terms have to be, in a way, inclusive because uh, yeah. Um, otherwise, uh, it's um, if you just uh, limit to uh, biology, you uh, you leave out the very important parts that are actually defining how women and men are living in their lives in this society. If I may, to add or come back to Neme, to your uh, initial question that there are problems and troubles as far as gender equality is concerned, then yes. Now I'm about that this class is not half full, but half empty. Uh, and every coin has that darker side as well. And that is about don't open up any internationally agreed uh, document, mm -hmm. basic document. For instance, mm -hmm. that uh, you mentioned, uh, Christian, uh, Beijing and the New England too. Mm -hmm. Beijing Agreement 1995 mm -hmm. is at the moment, not radical, but so good document. Mm -hmm. And if we sort of open something there, look, there will be so many those who read and write and would like to add and take off. Mm -hmm. So let it be closed like that is. And in uh, in area of we started with violence against women at the moment currently, and I see that from Canada, from Embassy of Canada is there. Big debate is now with Canada. And that is every woman treaty. Every woman treaty is kind of who can be against that kind of initiative, which is all about uh, 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 to abolish, to, to end, I mean, uh, gender-based violence against women. So, but the thing is now have a look, countries who initiated that, I'm not mentioning United States, because they are not part of uh, 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 CEDO, I mean, that treaty body, but Costa Rica, quite, Nice, Latin America, I do believe that name you have been there, me not. But anyway, in all records, that is nice. 
um, Latin America. Nice Latin American state. And then, have a look, others. Lot, starting from the uh, uh, Republic of Congo, um, and more. They are collecting, at the moment, signatures to somehow um, challenge CEDO, which is agreed, like I told you, 1940s, and signed by 189 mm -hmm. countries or state parties. That seems to be good and very appropriate and a timely uh, document. Mm -hmm. But now what is the substance? And that is watering down and making softer and focusing only one kind of element as far well, gender equality or women's rights are concerned. So basically, and what now to go to Canada? In May, there were um, quite um, articles in Canadian, uh, ca Canadian press. And um, firstly, that is a good thing, because those countries need excellent front runner, and Canada is excellent front runner. If we are talking about treaty, every woman treaty, but there are academia, like you told, and they are really against telling that. For what, what, what is the aim of that every woman treaty? And now already more than 100 countries have signed that. And, and, and my question is, what is going on? And like you, Christian, said, a lot is going on, and that's not in the correct or good direction like that was back last century when really there was big hope that gender equality is coming up and that we are equal, men and women. <laughs> Sorry. So let's stop here and open up this for questions because um, we put on the table so many different issues and, and uh, questions and, and answers also, but, uh, but this debate in the world is going on about women's rights, as we see. So your comments, your, your questions, please. Let's start. <laughs> <coughs> Uh, thank you, first of all, for this uh, wonderful debate. It was very interesting to listen. Um, so something that came to my mind during the debate was um, a term that was used. Um, yeah, as a, as a philosopher by, tra by training, I'm uh, used to you know picking uh, picking apart every term that is used, and um, the term was reproductive health. And I kind of wanted to think about the repercussions of this term, especially in international fora. If we use this term, I feel like it kind of uh, presupposes that women's you know, rights are connected to their reproductive rights. And I feel like this is not kind of something, this is not the idea that we want to, to really bring on, especially in international fora where it might, you know, give the wrong impression. So, yeah, I don't really have a direct question. I just wanted to kind of, you know, bring some food for thought. Thanks. Somebody wants to, Christian. Yes, uh, thank you. I think it's an uh, it's important part of uh, women's rights because for centuries, for a long time, this is a, have, has been the arena where the, uh, the big conflict, in a way, lies. Um, a, and, and, and I think this is uh, therefore important to kind of um, bear in mind as well because these are the rights that uh, often get, are on the forefront in a way that uh, they're easiest to uh, take away. And, and make um, women's lives very, very difficult. But I think it's also important to sort of think that uh, when we talk about reproductive rights, we shouldn't only talk about women's reproductive rights, but also men's mm -hmm. uh, reproductive health uh, mm -hmm. as well. So, so this is uh, part of the equation as well, that, uh, that it sh this should be there. Anybody, please. Yes. Uh, well, thanks for the, this very, very interesting uh, debate. I mean, along the discussion, uh, there has been an idea that has been repeated uh, quite often, and is the, the, the fact, and I think we can all agree, that after years of advancement in, in rights, we're seeing a certain backlash, including, including in the West. And it is definitely true that both in, in Europe and the, the US and, uh, and other countries, uh, we, we are seeing the emergence of, of uh, political parties, of factions that are uh, quite largely based precisely on 
this on uh, on, the, on this backlash against feminist um, feminism and other right movements. And um, this political movement is quite often based on a particular demographic: men uh, older than 40 who feel apparently threatened by uh, socioeconomic change in general and more uh, specifically by by the empowerment of, of women. I mean, my question is: How do you think we could engage this this demographic that uh, clearly is in the base of of, of, of many of many movements and that feel yeah threatened by the change by the language sometimes I mean this, this the kind of you know this these crazy assumptions that you that you hear about that everybody will be forced to whatever it's it's all, all coming from this particular segment of society how do we work with that well um, as having political background then uh, that's quite ideological, I mean, <laughs> for me uh, to, to understand. Those who are uh, right and populist parties, I mean, th that's so good to, to make a good uh, uh, election campaigns. Because, I mean, everybody, uh, as far electorate is concerned, has kind of idea about man and woman, family life, and so on. So, uh, um, but to combat with that, I could say only like, uh, uh, take uh, that convention. CEDO, I mean, uh, which is, I mean, like a long run, but still, I mean, uh, and I bring one example. Uh, Hungary was in Geneva and we had constructive dialogue. That is country, what we Europeans know, what are problems there. So instead to state, usually I'm stating that there are kind of steps uh, or achievements, Hungary got everything like minuses. Plus that in their curricula, they sort of like abolished, they just wiped out, I mean, uh, gender equality. Men and women uh, is replaced. So I mean, th th that is kind of slow, but it doesn't mean that not noticed. So they got, say, uh, in school, they didn't pass the exam, like country, mm -hmm. as far as women's rights are concerned. Yes, and if to um, maybe uh, say a few things more um, uh, while I was gathering my thoughts, um, um, I think uh, there has been quite some uh, literature around it as well, and uh, I remember reading, um, uh, it's al always, of course, easy to blame everything about, uh, to neoliberalism and uh, mm. economic policies, but, uh, but the fact is that, um, indeed, certain groups of men have been uh, left behind, uh, in a way, and, uh, and, and if they haven't been sort of also subjects of uh, the equality policies, for example, then uh, there is somebody else that comes in and fills this void. Uh, if, uh, if their concerns haven't been really heard, then somebody else uh, comes and says, like, you are the victim. You, uh, it's because of uh, feminism that you are suffering. So, so in a way, uh, this is, I think, um, a, a little bit uh, uh, a tale that uh, we should uh, a little bit look into the mirror of what we haven't done uh, in the past properly. And, and try to correct uh, this historical um, sort of um, uh, mistake or, uh, that, that we have done. So, so in a way, men should be uh, much more also as the, the subjects uh, of, uh, of equality uh, policies. Because this also the victimization, that's a term of today's world that certain groups always want to be victims. So what Swedish perspective to this? How to explain to those men and then Ukrainian, where you are advancing the feminist agenda, but how to explain that to men to understand? I think this. what arguments that we have used uh, more generally has been um, economic empowerment and what it does to a society when men and equal have the same opportunities. And that if you uh, limit the opportunities for 50% of the population, you get uh, much less uh, growth, you get much less creativity, or it could also be with certain minority groups or immigrants. But if you all want to be steeped in the same little box, uh, you become rather poor over time. So I think that's an argument that we have used. But if that then is grounded in groups like this, I'm not too sure, because you also have to have ears of a certain size to, to take those arguments in. And I think this is so ideological. And it's so much about power relationships. 
I think if he has a question, there was one yeah, question over there. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I definitely agree with Ingrid. That's how we should explain also that everyone has to have equal opportunities and uh, through economic empowerment. And that's what we are trying to do as well. Uh, of course, during the war, it's very difficult to, to do this. And there are, it's, we have our own challenges uh, during the war. But at the same time, I see huge progress in, in Ukraine. And I, th I think every leader, including our president Zelensky, he's very much into having more women. And he tries to explain, right now, actually, we have more women in sector of defense and security security than in others. And well, it, it could be prompted by the war as well from 2014. Because uh, when the Russian aggression started in 2014, by 2.5 times, uh, the, uh, qu uh, the quantity of, uh, uh, of women increased in armed forces. So it's, it's a huge figure. So yes, right now, I think it's ideology is one thing, of course. It's, it's, it's a sensitive issue. But uh, I think through economic empowerment, it will be sort of easier to explain to, to mm -hmm. people how we could sustain equal opportunities for women, men and women. The next question, please. Yes, um, my name is Catherine. I'm from the German Embassy. So as you mentioned, the German FFP, I felt a bit uh, yeah, provoked <laughs> by giving perhaps two details uh, what we do with the FFP. So one is definitely we will look at our representation and by far the Ministry of Foreign Affairs can improve. It's the last one on the whole list of ministries in Germany. Although what we try right now is to look particular at our resources. So we have in, introduced the gender budgeting. So we're really looking at what type of projects, what type of financing goes into gender equality, gender, which what is gender um, sensible and um, also transformative. But I wanted to touch on something you said, uh, Mrs. Ambassador um, Tashman, in regards to um, rights. And I feel that sometimes when you look at the feminist foreign policies, perhaps this is um, not really looked at in general as our work at dis diplomats. Uh, feminist foreign policy does not generally only mean looking at women's rights, but in general looking at groups who are marginalized, sort of stepping outside our situation, being me as a woman or somebody else as a man, and looking in particular what are the blind spots when we look at a general observation of a situation, and looking at the blind spots and really forcing us to look at the blind spots and look at a different position. And um, thank you very much for raising that uh, topic for economic properties. I think that's something um, which we have to look even more um, looking at crisis conflicts and in particular also on peace building because when you do peace building it can only really give a proper peace if you look at all the different levels of society who are marginalized and um, sort of ignored. Um, so Ms. Teichmann, may I ask you perhaps um, to say a bit about peace building processes? Um, Sweden has been involved also in foreign for and, and looked at through the angle of foreign policy? That's a huge question. <laughs> yes, we have been engaged in that for, for men. Just thank you for, for raising the blind spots. And it's not only about women, it's about uh, vulnerable groups. And I'm one who would not like to see women as a vulnerable group or victim. We are actors like many others. But there are groups that can be much more vulnerable than, than women are. I think we have, through both politically, uh, through our ministry, and also through our development assistance, we have been engaged in many peace building processes uh, in many different parts of the world, in Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East. We have a re relatively new institute in Alexand no, in Jordan, uh, which is kind of a Middle East wider dialogue institute on peace building process and where we can support. Uh, for a few years, we had a, um, a women's mediation network. Uh, there are quite a few uh, globally. There is one in each Nordic country, I trust. Uh, there is a global alliance for for uh, for for um, for women's uh, peace building network. That was part of of ours. Our government is now revisiting whether we should have it and how useful it was. But that enabled female. Uh, senior female diplomats to engage in areas where they have been active. Uh, some of us were quite old, some older than I, uh, but they worked at the Horn of Africa, they were engaged in Yemen, they worked in processes where you need deep, deep knowledge to be able to move small processes slowly forward. So I think that we have that uh, in our system, and I know that other countries who are represented here have that too, Norway, for example, and, and Finland. Um, 
There was created a few years ago uh, a global alliance for the, uh, the women's mediation networks, and I was in New York when that was launched. That was a fantastic uh, occasion at the UN where you can have all these networks from, from all over the world and also give inspiration to other countries and regions to form that, also to advance the agenda and to engage in peace processes. Not, maybe perhaps not an answer to your question, but an attempt. <laughs> Yes, there's a question over there. Where's the microphone? Oh. Okay, let's do the Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I will try to keep it brief, and maybe my question is directed uh, especially to Marianne, but of course I'll be happy if the others uh, com can comment as well. Uh, I'm going to come back to what you raised about the, the, the women being got into the parliaments, yeah? Uh, I would probably stick to Europe because I think that there is a huge difference between uh, parliaments, you know, in different countries, and I would I would argue that in, in some countries there are parliaments more by name rather than by, uh, by, by, by nature. But, but let's stick to Europe. I mean, what, uh, and particularly maybe to Estonia, I mean, what, what, uh, what would be in your opinion the way to increase the participation of women in the parliament and in politics generally? Because me coming from the Czech Republic, I see this is a, this is a big problem, you know, and I see it really reflects on the quality of our policy making, which I, I would uh, argue could be much better if we had a, kind of more equal representation. Uh, I, I can see two ways, you know, there is a regulation, that means, and I think some uh, countries went down that line, that they basically order by law to have a certain number of female candidates, usually, you know, parity, 50-50% on the candidates list, or you can try to work more with the political parties and kind of try to incentivize them, you know, to, 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 to work more uh, with female leaders and, uh, you know, to educate, you know, let's say, the, uh, the class, you know, of women, uh, women politicians, so to say. So what, in your opinion, uh, would be the, the best way for, for Estonia and perhaps for other countries that are in a similar situation. Thank you very much. In fact, you answered uh, in, in your question there were, I mean, two possible ways. One, uh, which is about, say, quota system, although I stopped to use that and I went, or let's say for, for me that is parity, right? Because population is more or less 50-50. In Estonia, there are more women than men, even. And women are better educated. So I mean, uh, I would say that why to keep wise women out of decision making, right? Uh, so um, yes, one way is to introduce uh, amendment in electoral law. Mm -hmm. Me and my political uh, group, we introduced that. I mean, uh, a year was 2017, but definitely first too late before, I mean, next elections took place. And secondly, I always sort of make that uh, uh, example. We were in the beginning 16 who signed that that is good amendment. Let's, let's make it. And after heated debate, we got 17. We have how many members in parliament? 101. No way. So late and then secondly, I mean, not popular. But the other thing is, like you correctly said, internally, I mean, political parties make themselves kind of commitments. And so did my Social Democratic Party, I mean, a uh, long time ago, but those were uh, debates as well. That was not like granted or let's say that, well, you women are so good, okay, we would like replace me, says so kind of man politician, never. So, but, but anyway, we had that. And if you look, I mean, at that very day when election night is taking place, uh, uh, two last um, elections always, as, uh, our party got, I mean, the highest figure of women, due to that, I mean, list what we introduced or that commitment to ourselves in, in our political party. Unfortunately, others haven't taken that over. And that attempt to make kind of uh, uh, amendment in electoral law, it takes, I mean, I mean, quite time before, and it needs to carried, to be carried. If not, then forget about it. So, I mean, uh, I see that uh, uh, women could be, uh, in one hand, more active, kind of more with straight back. I mean, well, we are educated, and our place is around the uh, uh, table. If not, you are giving that, I'm coming with my chair, for instance, right? But, well, we are sort of taught 
a bit differently. So those are all about stereotypes. But I see in younger generation that younger generation, those um, young uh, female politicians, they are much more ambitious. Mm -hmm. And in society, I see that mm -hmm. uh, uh, young, educated Estonian women, yes. they are much more ambitious than, I mean, my generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have hope there. But I mean, it's a very slow process. And, and still, we haven't, in Riigi Goku, one third 33%, we haven't that kind of criteria, which means that either all, either female or male voice is heard or sort of fixed. One third is needed for, not there. So, four more years. Not good answer to you, but, but uh, what but I want to... Let, let's take one more yeah. question. Great, okay. Otherwise, we can continue those debates outside in the in the reception, but uh, there, are, there are a couple more questions, please. Thank you. My name is Effie from the British Embassy. Thank you to all the panelists. I think I actually wanted to um, build on that question, but maybe none of you might be able to answer it, and maybe Mina Lina might be the one. But I wanted to know, because this, the topic of this discussion is human, uh, with, with, women's rights is human rights, and that applies in peace as well as in conflict, and we focused most of the discussion today <laughs> on conflict. So I, I think I wanted to know a little bit more about what Estonia is doing in the area of gender mainstreaming in its policies domestically. Is that Christian for you? Yes. So uh, domestically, uh, and gender mainstreaming, this is required by law. Uh, um, I'm sure you, uh, you know that. Uh, and um, I would say that there, there is a huge gap in the implementation. So uh, when right now we are, um, for example, I'm just giving you an example, we are in the middle of the Green Deal, Green tra Transformation, right? So there is a lot of, lot of money coming to Estonia. The requirement should be that all of these pol policies, measures that are developed should have um, the gender approach there as well. So the impact analysis, um, well, ideally also gender budgeting, different tools in gender mainstreaming used. The reality is that when I read those, there is very, very little. Basically none, I would say. So my office uh, right now, we are in the middle of this project to analyze, so what is this problem? Why? Uh, the um, different governmental bodies that are uh, designing these uh, policies or measures. Um, why do they not apply gender mainstreaming? We hope to get results by October. And we will definitely uh, share these uh, widely and, uh, and hopefully we get some of the answers. But already uh, I, I think I would assume there is still very little knowledge how to do that in the public sector. Mm -hmm. Even there could be willingness to do so, but, uh, but people don't know how to do it. And it's a question that, uh, of the resources as well. People would say that, oh, this takes uh, too much time, it's too complicated. Well, it doesn't really have to be uh, that complicated, right? You can uh, integrate it to your normal policymaking uh, uh, processes. But um, yeah, so, so I guess that's my um, answer to you right now. I hope this will change. I really do hope because I, I truly feel that this is the key in order to really change the uh, society for, for better. Any more questions? If not, let's just finish the discussion here and we can continue it outside. It's a great summer day, so let's start <laughs> the official part and then now have the informal part. So thank you very much for participating. Thank you so much. It was very thank interesting. Thank you so much. Many mm -hmm. issues to touch upon, but uh, we tried different sites. Let's continue the discussion outside. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.